I'm Thea Keith Lucas, along with my colleague Trish Weinman. I coordinate RADIUS, a program for conversations about ethical questions here at MIT. And we are very honored to have with us tonight our own Sally Hasslinger, the Ford Professor of Philosophy and Women and Gender Studies here at MIT, and two wonderful guests, Maisha Cherry, Assistant Professor of Philosophy the University of California, Riverside, and Jesse Prince, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the City University of New York for a conversation about hope. So let's get started. What does hope mean to you today? I feel like it's been changing every day for the last couple months as we've landed here on November 10th. Um, what's on your mind? Maisha, do you want to start us off? Is that a volunteering of me to start us off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, this is this is this is a tough question. So I would say um, I think what has been proven as a result of the outcome of this election or elections around the country is that I am reminded of the importance of not hoping in abstract ideas, but hoping in people. And particularly, more specifically, um, hoping in Black women, hoping in Native folk, hoping in people of color who refuse to be adjacent to and complicit in white supremacy, and just white folks who are just willing to work on um, their shit. Like I, I, I'm reminded of the power of what happens when you invest that kind of hope in people and how they're able to show up. Um, and I, I, I think that as a result of response to the election, it shows why I do not hope in institutions or other kinds of people, but I, I'm reminded of the power of and the joy that comes when you hope in particular citizens. And I think, I think my hope have been satisfied to that extent. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, I find myself a bit torn here because there is this, this sense of, of, of jubilation, um, Sally mentioned before the discussion, relief, all these feelings. I join this conversation as something of a hope skeptic, someone who is, concerned about limits of hope. So, I mean, through this emotional roller coaster of the last few days, I, I think we've seen some of the, the limits of hope. I mean, one thing is that as we desperately hope for this to end, hope uh, often involves an expression of lost agency. It's, it's, it arises when we want something good, but we don't think we're in a position to do anything about it. So it becomes this kind of, it's a, it's a bastion for those who can do no more than cross their fingers. And a, and a kind of second limit is, I think we all find ourselves hoping for this president who does have a mixed track record. You know, Biden is one of the architects of mass incarceration. He's an unabashed neoliberal. He rebukes progressives at every turn. And, you know, I think hope for better or worse often requires us to, uh, or urges us to content ourselves with small gains. And that's, that's double-edged. And a, a third kind of concern is relating to the moment is that, um, you know, Biden used this hope slogan and in, in a lot of his advertising and his closing of the last debate, he mentioned the idea of replacing fear with hope. And that rings so true. I think we've all felt so, so afraid, so uncomfortable uh, all these uh, four years that we can finally exhale. Um, but I can't help wondering whether this invocation of hope, this call to turn to hope, is also an invocation to passivity. And are we being asked to enter a kind of passive posture? So there are some fears we should have. Fear shouldn't go away. There are some bad things we're facing in addition to, to COVID and all that. We have growing inequality. We have gentrification. We have you know, huge disparities in health outcomes that are not showing signs of getting uh, better and are, of course, right now greatly exacerbated. Um, the fact that Trump got 8 million more votes, including gains in people of color and members of LGBTQ communities, that 
is a cause of fear, serious concern. So the idea that we should hope, yes, maybe so, but you know, there are also legitimate reasons to be concerned and fear is, is motivating and helpful. So um, I think it's very important to see uh, that we, we can't rest ourselves content in hope that we still have a lot to do. So I wanna pick up on, on something that Maisha sh shared in, in a way in response to the notion of hope as passivity. Because Maisha was talking about hope in people that gets paid off by their actions. And I think that, that I would like to distinguish optimism and pessimism, which are kind of cognitive attitudes toward, is this gonna happen or is this not gonna happen? Or, or can I predict this or can I not? With this spectrum of, that hope lies on, which is despair, confidence, and hope in the middle. And it's, a, it's not just a cognitive approach. It's, it has to do with the will. It has to do with the, the throwing yourself into a possible future. And so when you despair, which I think I've been relieved of complete despair, which I was feeling at certain points um, prior to the election and in the days after the election, there's this sense that there is nothing one can do. It's just overwhelming. Confidence has this sense that, no, it's, it's the cognitive part. No, this is gonna happen and I'm gonna do it. But hope is this other thing that I find so puzzling because there's this possibility, no certainty, just a mere possibility, but it's a possibility I put my will behind that I'm, I'm committed to. And so being, com being committed to other sort of hope in them is to hope for their agency, to, have to, to build on their agency. And so it isn't just crossing your fingers. It isn't just predicting. Um, it's, it has this willful dimension to it. At least that's how I, I hope that it's not mere passivity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. So there's just two kind of thinkers that are that is in my head are in my head right now. That's Catherine Nolak and that's Adrian Martin. So Adrian Martin would like to think that there are two kinds of hopes, right? That there is there's passive hope, which is kind of like a fantasy kind of thing, daydreaming kind of thing. And then there's the active, the active hope, right? So yes, we kind of believe that something is probable. Um, and we have a wish for it, but we're also, you know, having a goal and plan in order to obtain that, that particular uh, goal. Uh, but I'm also, in some ways, Norlock also distinguishes between kind of pessimism and, and optimism. And she makes room for, um, for the fact that pessimism and, and hope can exist in the sense that there are lots of people that have been optimists in, in the record of, of freedom fight. Martin Luther King, one might say, was an optimist. He believed that uh, the arc of the Mora universe is pointing, you know, is, is there's moral progress. And he also had, had hoping, hoping people, right? Very optimistic about our, our potential as people. Um, but Nurlock, and I would suggest that even myself, is kind of pessimistic, pessimist in those two particular regards. I do not believe that at every step, things are always getting better. Um, and I also uh, believe that people are biased. <laughs> uh, people have the potential to do evil. And a lot of times they choose to do evil. Um, but given that knowledge, I adjust my hope. Hence why I suggest that I hope in people. I also adjust my goals um, and I continue to be diligent um, as a result. And if there's, there's reasons for fear, right? I adjust all those attitudes and all those emotions, but I continue to remain diligent despite the pessimism. And I, I continue to still try to strive towards that which I still think is probable and that which I hope will be achieved. I love that, uh, Maisha, this idea that hope is compatible with pessimism. And I, I had thought in preparing for this about the, the King quote, and I was like, no, it does not bend. <laughs> but what's interesting is that there's, in addition to the optimist and pessimism, there's this meliorist position, which is, you know, it's not a prediction. It's about, I'm damn well going to make it better. Right, and it's it's in spite of the pessimism, in spite of the fact that the our universe is not bending by itself toward justice. It's like kind of kind of Emil. My husband calls me an ameliorator, right? And I think that there's a part of me that just feels like, okay, I've got to throw myself into this, 
and see what can be done, even if the possibilities are remote. Right. I just want to echo a... uh, this thought about hope in, because I think so much of the literature, including Adrian's book, which is, is wonderful, is still in a certain way individualistic. And I think my own thinking and probably all of ours tends to think about hope as this thing contained in each of us. And, and that sense of hope in another, and Sally mentioned this idea of kind of, you're, when you do that, you don't assume they are lacking agency. It's, it's actually mm -hmm. a recognition of right. their agency, of their power, of their potential that uh, seems to undergird that hope. So maybe hope in is a place where that passivity of hope can actually find contact with, with genuine action. I was wondering if, if there are different um, times or different places in a strategy, because it sounds like, Jesse, you were pointing towards fear and possibly even desperation as being essential motivators. Um, but I wonder if we can always do our work from that spot um, without completely burning out. Um, so I wonder if, what do you think about the strategic role of hope? Way in. It was kind of addressed to you, Jesse. Oh, okay. Yes, directly addressed to you, Jesse. I honestly, I mean, there, there is, for, as a, you know, putting on my psychology hat, there is an empirical literature suggesting that hope um, can motivate, hope can lead to increases in, in engagement. For example, there's a lot of work on hope in educational psychology. But there are some troubling findings too. So, for example, um, when African American students are asked how hopeful they are, um, but also how much exposure they have to discrimination, uh, paradoxically, it's called the paradox of hope, those who are more hopeful find their motivation and their well being more imperiled. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, in, in terms of strategic hope, if we rely on it too much, when hopes get dashed, there's motivational inertia. So for me, fear, yes, but especially you know, anger, indignation, outrage, maybe even you mentioned despair, or those, those kind of emotions of mourning, uh, you know, that classic scene in network where you, know, you get a tipping point and, and we all just shout, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. I don't think that's an expression of hope. I think it's an expression of the opposite, um, but it does get people out in the streets. So um, I don't wanna deny that hope can can be a motivator. I think there are moments where if you don't have that dim glimmer of hope, you're, you're you know, really gonna give up. And uh, Adrienne Martin has a chapter on suicide in her book, I mean, it's hope is, and she talks about hope in a biomedical context, and you know, people, people in oncology clinics. So there are all kinds of ways in which hope allows us to move forward. Um, and I, so I definitely don't wanna come here as an anti-hope propagandist, but but I do want to plea for these other emotions and suggest that because of its risks, because of its potential for inertia uh, under conditions of disappointment, hope can't be our only tool. Yeah, I, 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 no, I was gonna say, you're not gonna find either Maisha or me complain about <laughs> anger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Jesse, I do want to say something about the fear thing, right? So, in some ways, I want to, I want to, I mean, we know that that fear has kind of like this action tendency for us to kind of not really go towards our, the object or the cause of that that particular fear, but to run away. Um, and one of the things I've been um, kind of worried about is looking at Twitter, and in some sense, I see. Uh, I mean, a lot of responses from folks, but one of the things that I've noticed is this kind of fear, right? So people have looked at uh, what Republicans have done and have basically solicited kind of warnings. Beware, this is what they're about to do. And it's not as, it's not really cognitive, right? It's really pointing to, they want us to be fearful and so on. And it's made in good, I think, good intentions, right? And as I'm reading these kind of fearful tweets, um, I don't share the same fear and I'm, wor I'm worried about that fear contagion. Here's why. I do not believe in more, in, in more progress, right? At least the, the linear, more progress is linear. Um, but I do believe in more moral failure, right? So 
I mean, a lot of times we like to talk about how we progress morally, which means that we're getting better. And we don't really mention that that's only made possible or thought to be made possible when evil fails at one point or, 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 or another. And I think history and also more currently, no matter how evil has been successful, it has also failed, right? Slavery was an institution, it lasted a long time, but it failed, right? Um, and even on the plantation, as much as slave owners wanted to make those African slaves, right? They rebelled, that project failed, right? The fact that I'm here talking with you all, a black woman with a PhD, whoever, all the sexism and all that stuff to try to get in the way of that, that was failure, right? So even as I look at what, what Republicans are doing and even the persistence of, of racism online and also in our daily lives, that just does not make me afraid. Right, I just see it as another example of how evil has failed. And I'm more confident in my team, right? And hoping in my team because they have shown that even when evil shows its face, they are willing to fight and work diligent, Georgia being an example. And so that's where my hope is. And if you was to compare my hope with fear, fear is down here and my hoping in my team, um, as you know, LeBron James said this during the playoffs, um, compared his team to another team, he basically said, we built different. And he was basically talking about on his team, there were so many people who could rise to the occasion. There are so many ways in which they can play defense and offense, they could adjust. That's how I feel about my liberating team. There's a lot of ways in which we can adjust to whatever comes our way. There's a lot of people who just remain persistent no matter what comes in their way. I'm confident with that. Um, and that makes me less fearful of the opposing team. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with that. I, I definitely don't want to champion fear. I do think fear is also very destructive and there's a lot of evidence that not only does it make us retreat, but um, it balkanizes us. It makes us you know, hate out groups and lash out in ways that are, that are very destructive. Plus too, I, I, I take very seriously the fear that was introduced by the cultivation of hate during these last four years. And just this anxiety, even now, just, I mean, people are afraid of a, of a civil war. They're afraid of violent retribution of all these people who have been encouraged to regard this uh, election as a fraud. This refusal to listen to facts. I mean, Trump did better in Philadelphia in 2020 than in 2016. No one is saying that. You know, the, the fact that he did better than all the polls, the fact that all these Republicans got their congressional seats. If there was fraud, it was on the Republican side. They did much better than they should have given all the forecasts. But that cultivation of A, um, this is a uh, fraud and, and B, it's the result of a cabal of a conspiracy. It's that fear of the in-group. If you look at how people come to justify torture, if you look at how people come to justify genocide, it's always this sense of the enemy from within. So once you start getting into the politics of fear, I think there are very, very serious dangers and we feel them, we face them and they affect real lives. So I don't wanna champion fear. So I think I, I meant something a bit more metaphorical or should have, which is that if we don't remain cognizant of the actual harms and dangers, if we don't keep those in the foreground and just feel like, okay, everything's gonna be all right now, then we run the risk. And this happened, you know, during, I. I think we should give Obama the pass because he faced a very hostile Congress, but, but the Clinton-Obama years did involve a fair degree of investment in a, uh, in a political uh, philosophy uh, that I think cultivates a certain kind of uh, maybe belief in moral progress, confidence that things will get better. And, and it's really maybe better than fear, something like vigilance uh, that we need to cultivate. I'd like to, to pick on this, pick up on this, but also go back to Thea's question about the strategic use of hope. So I think there is a risk if you think of hope just as, you know, holding, you know, sort of crossing your fingers and hoping somebody else is gonna take care of it or something like that. That's, you know, set that conception of hope aside and, and think of it more as a, an investment, a human, emotional investment in something that is maybe just merely possible. It seems to me that there are times of disappointment when, when the great goal you might have comes to seem impossible. And so hope is dashed. And so then the question is, 
what happens. And one option is you get really afraid and then again, you back off. But the hope, one way that hope can work is it does say, you know, you talked about small gains, but it does say, okay, there are steps along the way that might be taken. There's this constructive aspect of hope. It is a building idea rather than a retreating idea. And so I think that sometimes what happens to me when I, you know, I hope for world peace and justice, right? And that hope gets dashed every single day, right? I get crushed by, you know, the seeming impossibility of that. But then I start thinking, okay, but what can I do right here, right now? What can I do with this group? Or what can I do with that group? And that feels to me driven by hope rather than being driven by fear. Just, I mean, to not be too fetishistic about words here, I, I do kind of wonder whether the, the word hope brings us to the wrong register. Because when we're talking about those incremental gains, it's again, not that we just hope they'll happen. It's that we really um, work for them. So in, in my thinking about empathy, I've come to the, the view that empathy has a dark side that really outweighs its benefits, but there are cousin concepts and people talked about compassion, which was I think more of the same, but one that really speaks to me is the notion of solidarity. And empathy is problematic for a very similar reason. It's, it's um, not motivating. It, it leads people to kind of wallow in the, in the agony of another's misery, but it doesn't get you out the door. And solidarity, which is also not presumptuous, it's not pity, it doesn't assume that you have epistemic access to somebody else's struggle, but it says, I'm gonna stand with you. And that notion of standing, of being there, of fighting the fight, I think is better than empathy. Um, likewise with hope, I think a successor concept in the neighborhood might be something like determination. So rather than hoping for improvement, determination in bringing that change about may be a concept we could do more work with. Or maybe commitment or- Commitment, conviction. Conviction. Now, there's been important work on how empathy sets up a, a promise of a relationship and very readily, if that's not acted on, something like that sort of passive side of it, if it's not acted on, then it sets up a betrayal. And that sounds very similar to what you're speaking of, that hope sets up the possibility of a, a demoralizing disappointment. I just, so before we jump back in, I just want oh. to take a moment and invite um, folks in our audience. There is a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, and we would love to hear from you if you'd like to pass a question to us. Thanks very much. So historically, you know, faith, hope, and love were sort of linked mm -hmm. in the Christian tradition. And faith, I think, is supposed to be um, a, a sort of belief-like sort of attitude toward um, something. Hope is supposed to be a, a will, a habit of the will rather than a habit of the mind. Um, and, and it's, and then love, you know, well, let's not talk about love. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> but, but so it does, there, I mean, I don't want to fetishize either, but there is a history of, of linking hope with the will, um, not just with um, faith, not just a faith, not just an optimism, not just a, just a cognitive way of engaging. But I really agree with you that for me as a meliorator, when I think that that hope is a, a way of, of being committed to an effort, I don't think it's an individual effort. I think it's insofar as it's a social, it's, an, it's a thought that the world can be better and that, and a commitment to its being better, you can't do it alone. It has to be a commitment in solidarity with others. So to that extent, I completely agree. There has to be some notion of solidarity here. Um, otherwise, like an individual hope, like what's that? Right, right. I mean, one of these, I mean, to answer your question, Thea, about kind of the strategic aspects of hope, I mean, I agree with everything that Jesse and Sally just said. I mean, 
I would just go back to kind of what I uh, said at the beginning as far as how I'm thinking about hoping the concept of like uh, being a pessimist, right? Um, and with that pessimism, you, rec you realize that evil would not be eradicated, but it can be reduced, right? Um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a recognition that freedom is a constant struggle, right? <laughs> With that knowledge, right? Then that adds in that adds to the strategy, right? It tells us what should be our goals. <laughs> um, it tells us how to adjust our plans when we do indeed go about doing the particular kind kinds of actions that Jesse and Sally was was alluding to. So our audience members have some good questions for us of how to situate hope. Um, first one is, what do you think is the relationship between hope and grit? And there's another one that's um, the connection between hope and wonder. And I think those are interesting side by side. Hmm. Where would you situate hope compared to wonder and grit? So I have a view about grit, but it kind of comes from a use of the term in a particular popular discourse and sort of maybe um, sort of popular psychology discourse where it's often used to suggest that people who aren't doing well in life lack grit, right? And I think this is deeply problematic because it personalizes and individualizes structural injustice. And so, and so, you know, oh yeah, this or that or the other person um, might have been successful if they had just persisted. But no, their persistence was not the, the issue. There were other things that were the issue. So there's a particular conception of grit that I find very problematic, but resilience. I mean, I do think that that um, we ought to, you know, aim to be resilient. And I think that what Maisha was talking about is her people, you know, her her community that she's talking about that she has has hope in. Um, talk about resilience, oh my gosh. And if, if you mean that, I think there is a deep connection with hope, but grit, mm. I mean, I, I share Sally's worry and I wanna go back to something Sally said a little bit earlier about solidarity. Um, so I, I, I prefer to use the word resilience than, than, than grit. Um, but if what we mean by resilience that, is that no matter what comes, I keep fighting. I wanna resist that as a moral duty and as a moral virtue, right? If we are in solidarity with each other, it presupposes that we have help in this thing. That when I get tired and I don't wanna be resilient today, I should be able to pass the baton, right? And you should not be disappointed. We're talking about hope and disappointment. You should not be disappointed in that particular um, call, right? And I hope in you to pick up the slack when indeed I'm tired and because oppression is tiresome. Racism and sexism is exhausting, right? Um, and to suggest that we have a moral obligation to always resist, always be resilient, I, I wanna resist that. And I think solidarity reminds us, what I call solidarity care reminds us that we can never do this thing alone. And even when we need to, to rest and be taken care of, we should be allowed to do just that. Maybe that's a segue to say something about wonder. I. I've just finished writing a book about wonder, so I have a lot to say about wonder. But but to keep it um, short, I didn't know that. Um, I, so I tell us wonder, more, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> as having three dimensions, one of them is is sensory, a sort of sensory engagement. The other is cognitive, a kind of perplexity, an inability to wrap your head around it. And the final I call spiritual, but it's a it's a kind of reverence. Um, and I think wonder has been an important impetus for science, for religion, and especially for art which are kind of these three very human vocations that seem so different from each other, but are sort of united in their sense of wonder. And I think on the face of it, wonder and hope are, are if not quite opposites, very, very different in their, um, in their job profile. Wonder is a sort of bit basking in the mystery, whereas um, hope is about aspiring for resolution. Um, on the other hand, and this is just a very, original questions, I've never thought about these two in conjunction, but I do really think, and this speaks to, to Maisha on the need for self-care because of the exhaustion, the fatigue of battling constantly against, uh, against various forms of bigotry and oppression. Wonder is our refuge. Wonder is the reminder 
of, of, of some of the greatest goods. And I think, especially if we think, for example, about the aesthetic impulse, there's a tendency to think about the art and the political as kind of just opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but I think so often when we, when we allow ourselves to step back and appreciate the mysteries of life, um, there is a kind of safe place, but also a kind of dignity in that. We feel at home in our smallness. We get out of ourselves and feel like we're part of something uh, larger. And we also see what it's all for, what, it, what really matters. So I think if we can give ourselves this refuge in, in the wondrous, um, it's both a haven from the fatigue, a reminder of what we're fighting for, and an opportunity to see ourselves as, as part of something larger. And I think that might help us go on with the struggle. So several folks have asked us to dig a little more into people's different experiences of hope. There was a question. Um, a distinction needs to be made regarding how hope have different effects on different people, depending on their abilities. I understand that people don't like to say that those who are not as able as others should still not lose hope, but I think such rhetoric can be at times detrimental by sowing seeds of false hope. And there's also a mention of sort of learned helplessness. Um, and in a con, sort of looking at the other poll, um, there was a question of who runs the risk of this worrisome passivity, white people or everyone else? Um, it, and says, uh, I'd suggest it's really only a temptation to whites because it will help them to settle back into a place where they don't have to deal with their shit, as Maisha said. Does she really quote me or do you do you quote me? <laughs> no, it is in quotes. Oh, right? oh yeah, I'm going to have to screenshot that. Quote of the evening. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy. obviously it is a white thing. Look. I mean, when somebody has their knee on your neck, it's not about hope at that moment, right? right? When, you're, when you're there under the thumb, it's not about hope. You're forced to act. Um, so I think what happens, the, the kind of danger of complacency may be a, a one that comes with privilege. Because when you're in that position where you're not forced just out of self-defense, out of survival to fight, and just a question, should I get up and help in this fight? Um, then the hope that things are, are getting better. Um, it's a little bit like when people worry about, about virtue signaling and echo chambers in social media. If you feel like activism just becomes semiotic where it's about saying you're in favor of this thing, but, but um, remaining on your tuchus, as my Yiddish speaking mother would say, um, you know, then, then we get complacency. So hope similarly is uh, a luxury that many people can't afford. Yeah, I, I would even say this is this is my being charitable, but also realistic. I would also say the more one thinks that one is privileged, uh, the more passive their hope may be, right? Um, and so one can hope that the economic situation gets better, but if you are a black or Latina philosopher and your job, you're still getting a paycheck every month um, and you're secure to a certain extent, um, you may be tempted for your hope to be a little bit less, less active, right? So I, I wanna say we need to also make room um, because it's not that right, rights are essentially so, right? It's because of where, the way in which the social world is structured. And I think a lot of us can fall into the temptation of being comfortable um, with our position in a certain kind of social structure that could also lead us to be, to be passive as well with our hope. I agree. And I think no one is privileged. I mean, we, th that, that is an important <laughs> construct, but we've just right. seen we could slip into fascism easily. There is a vulnerability that's shared. I went with the first um, major Black Lives Matter here uh, um, protest in Chapel Hill after George Floyd. One of the organizers said, first thing, like first thing out of her mouth was, if you are transphobic, leave. You are not part of us because we stand or fall together. If, you're, if you are tolerant of other forms of discrimination, you are enabling discrimination against the people who are marching here today. So if we don't all see that we are united 
in our vulnerabilities. And if we allow oppression against anyone, it is uh, potentially going to uh, bite us in the ass. If you think I mean, these people that Hillary called the the you know basket of deplorables, these Trump supporters, they do feel very vulnerable, and they are people who have seen declining opportunities in ways that I think we all need to reckon with and recognize. Because if we can't build lines of solidarity where we say, okay, our fight is your fight and your fight is our fight. America doesn't have a labor party. Like what's up with that? If we can't figure out how these struggles are connected, then we can never form the alliances that are necessary to deal with oppression. I mean, I, I would say Hillary Clinton called them deplorables. I would say that a lot of I want to be careful here because I have no data, no statistics to kind of back this up. But I think the working poor has always had been more prone to be more conscious of that solidarity. And I think that outsiders, um, but more specifically poor white, white folks have not been so aware of that need for that kind of solidarity. So just going back to the question though, I think it's really confusing because if you don't have hope, you're not going to act. Um, but if you do have hope, it seems like there's a passive form of it where you're not going to act. So what are your options? It just, it feels very confusing to me. I mean, if I don't have hope that something can be done, that there, that there, there is a possibility of things being better, then that feels to me like ultimate passivity. And that's, that's I just need to have that space for um, moral imagination. Um, yeah, the helplessness is what's at all. I mean, I can't, I mean, help, well, I'm not, I never, I mean, that's part of what's maybe part of my privilege is I feel like it's very hard to get me to the point where I'm feeling helpless because it's, it's always, it's this, intensity that that I'm always trying to bring to the situation but that's I'm very privileged in that right I have had many opportunities where I've been successful etc cetera, etc cetera. but it does feel to me as though in that moment of hopelessness where I, I, I there's nothing to be done um, that's when I've lost hope I, I it's wonder another... it's just sorry sorry yeah go, you can go ahead if we uh, it's a different question. So yeah. I'll say one thing and then I'll... But just a very quick thing. I mean, I, I do want, think we should reflect on whether hope is really necessary. And it, that, that has been a kind of view. Descartes argues for this in Passions of the Soul. It's a long, historically entrenched view. But I think in light of some of these other emotions we've talked about, like anger and outrage, it's hope may be helpful, but, but for, for the person who feels hopeless, there might be other tools to to motivate. And I, it's true that my anger takes me through anything. I mean, that's, that's kind <laughs> of, even when I've lost hope, my anger is there. So that's true. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> the question I wanted to bring up was, um, how does one nurture or teach hope in whatever sense you interpret the word? Um, or is it innate? I totally don't think it's unique. That's the that's, that's my easy answer. <laughs> I think I really. I mean, if you lived on planet Earth, <laughs> no. If you were born in the year 2020, <laughs> if you lived, if you lived at any point in 2020, um, you'll realize that it's not as innate. <laughs> it's not innate, right? I think it really needs it. It needs to be. I mean, I've never thought about it in this way. In, in some ways, I want to be careful with my wording here, but I do think it's something that needs to be that needs to be cultivated in the sense that I also don't think that it's having Ha having too much of it is a virtue vice. I mean, we could talk about, let me kind of figure that out of my head as far as virtues is concerned, the Italian perspective. But I do think it needs to be, something needs to be cultivated. I think it's something that, I think the world, um, all the atrocities and the evil that happens in the world, it's, it, it's as if it, de it desires to take every part of that hope away <laughs> um, and imagining something better or greater. Um, and so in the face of that, I mean, it, it takes work. And, and if you still have it at the, at the, you know, November, 2020, I mean, wow, good for you. I mean, that's a victory right there. Um, but I do think it, need, it really needs, it's not innate. I think it needs cultivating. 
And it's connected also, I mean, historically people, some philosophers have thought that hope was a vice because it required you not to look at the reality and that it was to, to override the evidence. And, and I, I, think, I think that's a question. To, but I do think that sometimes when we're faced with all the evidence that things are not gonna get, there's no, there's no hope, it's hope, you know, whatever, whatever, to nonetheless, sort of hold on to possibility, imagination, as Thea has mentioned a couple of times, moral imagination, sort of that political imagination to keep persisting with that. I think that takes work and you'd have to learn how to do it. I agree with all that. And in related to that, I would say we shouldn't cultivate hope, not directly. We should cultivate skill. And one of Obama's ways of expressing hope and maybe it's a misnomer in this concept is with the phrase, yes, we can. But the can there is really important to make that real, to empower people, you need to give them skills. And so you look at, the, you look at uh, inequality and you find, okay, well, there's income inequality, but there's also a great skill gap. And if you aren't empowering people to have the tools they need to make change, both for their own personal outcomes and, and make change on issues uh, that they care about, including issues of social justice, you, you have given them nothing to hope for. So I think the more you do to empower people by, by skill acquisition, um, the more you've done to give hope the impetus it needs to really be meaningful and not just empty. So the learning there is to have a strategy and try that strategy and to see one of those small gains you go we're talking you about job, earlier job training you go to a group of people who are worried about their prospects for employment and the idea of a hope training session for them is, is <laughs> insulting it's laughable it's like a joke let's have a yeah. session to feel it, now I, I don't want to overstate that because i think there is a way in which those feelings can make you feel empowered and can can uh, help you move on but if there's structural um inequality that makes it impossible, even if you're very hopeful to go out there and compete on the job market, then the best thing you can do to give people really a grounds for hope is the skill training. No, I think that in addition, I, I like the skill training and I believe it. And I, I think that we are I'm a Marxian enough to think that labor and work is, is you know, constitutive of, of, of our good and, and to do it and to have skill in doing it makes our lives meaningful. But I also think that what we need to do is create counter publics where we can do prefigurative politics. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, places, places and spaces where we can live together on terms that feel and are more fulfilling and satisfying and more just. And that can be a site of hope, right? Because, I mean, I know that I have some communities of people that keep me going because I know when I go into that little space that I can relate to people on terms that feel right to me. And even though the minute I walk out of that space, it's a shit show, right? And I can't tolerate it and I just, whatever, that space is so important to both keep my imagination you know, a light to keep us going and to and to make that seem like it's something to hope for. Um, so I'm really a believer in that kind of counter public space. And it's more than a skill. It's a, well, maybe it's a skill of solidarity, a skill of community, a skill of something like that. And it's one of our uh, participants. Um, what if part of solidarity is giving hope to others, that is being those in whom, as Maisha said, others can hope. So what we cultivate is not our own hope, but our being the grounds for others' hope. Um, that really speaks to the power of uh, those community spaces that you were naming. I think yeah, on yeah. that too, I think, again, uh, we, we do always run the risk of having hope in, in this person. So you know, one of the ways leadership can work out is you just stand behind this, you're, you know, this is what happened with Trumpism a little bit. I think people thought their savior has come and they just need to let him do, do the work. 
Um, but if you know, you think about that old Kennedy, uh, you know, line about ask what you can do for your country. If if you have leadership that doesn't say just don't have hope in me, I'm not here to save you. This is an old biblical thing in in Judaism. The Messiah will come when he's no longer needed. We need to lift our, ourselves up, and you need to give people hope hope in themselves. Um, my grandfather was one of the organizers of the March on Washington, and he spoke just before uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And his, his speech ended with, it's not enough to hope together. It's not enough to pray together. We need to act together. And I think so what leadership, you know, real leadership, effective leadership isn't have hope in me. That's the demagogue. It's have hope in yourselves, have hope in us, have hope in the collective, because if we stand together in activity, difference can come. Yeah, it's reminding me of a, of a quote, and I don't even know who's the author of it, but it, it, it basically says, we are the leaders we've been waiting for. We are who we've been waiting for. Exactly. Um, and that phrase really encompasses uh, what you're discussing, Jesse. I think what I would add to the cultivation piece, and this is kind of mixing in with um, the solidarity piece, I think one of the hardest, one of the most difficult things to cultivate, particularly when we're hoping in people, is trying to figure out, and we can call this a skill of some sort, um, of how to extend grace, when to extend it, right? How to handle disappointment, when to put someone in timeout, when the person is not deserving of timeout. Um, I don't have any answers for that, but I think that's one of the biggest things. I mean, I, I talked about, hey, one thing about pessimism, we need to recognize who we are as individuals. We are fallible. We are not as consistent as we, we would like to think. We are biased. And if we have all that stuff going on, that's not just a reality for those who we think are our opponents, <laughs> but it's also for any human being, particularly human beings that we love and people and human beings that we look up to, human beings that we have expectations of, they will fail those expectations and we have to figure out how to continue hope if, hoping in them if that's something that we should do and figuring out if it's something that we should continue to do um, is a lifelong skill um, that we have to continue to challenge ourselves to develop and to be a recipient of and also doing it for ourselves as well. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough cultivation project. So do we want to make a clear distinction um, between hope in good prevailing and fear of bad prevailing? Or is there a piece of hope that's just, I just hope it doesn't get any worse? Well, I, I mean, we, we, say, we use that language, but I don't know if we have a quantitative kind of thing that backs that kind of language up. I mean, I don't know, in, in ways in which we think that, we hope that things don't get worse. I mean, what do you mean by worse? And yeah. what justifies the worst and what is happening at this moment? I, at this moment could be worse. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, I would want the, the person or us to even be a little bit more clear about what we mean by those kinds of those kinds of statements. Um, I think one specific this um, just comes to mind for me. Um, one of the challenges in countering the climate crisis is that it's stopping something terrible from happening rather than sort of imagining a better world. Most often. Or if yeah, it's I, yeah, I think there are several options that can be on the table, right? So it could be the case that we stop things from happening and that's that's the best that we can do, right? So we can we probably can't go back and making the planet better, but we can, you know, kind of defend it in a way and not to make it worse. But I don't think all problems are like that, right? Um, you know, I mentioned evil reduction. I mean, I think there's a way to reduce evil. We may not be able to eradicate it, but we can reduce it. Um, so so I think, you know, depending on what the situation is, depending on what the problem is, I think there are several options on the table. So it's not kind of a dilemma or a false dilemma of sorts, the way that we may think that it is. Yeah. To, me, to me, it brings to mind a little bit the distinction between negative and, and positive liberty, the freedom to, you know, to, to do things and the freedom from oppression, um, to put it that way. And I've always, I've always found that distinction unhelpful. Um, because I think if, if somebody is stopping you, if somebody's holding you down, if there's this negative thing, then your ability to thrive is going to be thereby delimited. And I, so I don't think we can separate 
the hope to get rid of the bad and the hope for the good. I think they're inextricably uh, bound. I like this one. <laughs> They've all been great questions. Um, what do you think about other non-exhausting ways of resistance? I'm thinking here of people like Imani Perry or Lindsay Stewart who argue that there are forms of resistance or refusal that are grounded in a kind of joy. A yes. joy which is grounded outside of the influence and regulation of the powers that be. Does this joy exist independently of the political space of hope? So this yeah, is kind of that's where I'm thinking point. about the counter the counter publics, you know, that you can go into those counter publics and and be joyous and find a new form of life and a new way of engaging with each other. And and it's resistant, but its goal is not just to resist. Its goal is to create a new space, a, a new way of being in the world. And I think that that can be so powerful, both to energize and to, to keep us going, but it's also such a form of resistance because you're not supposed to be having fun unless you're doing it our way, you know, that other way, that dominant way. And it, when, you're, when you're celebrating life in a, in a different way, it is a profound form of resistance. Yeah, I um just a just a plug here uh, for those who are wondering um, about the latter's work. I have an interview with uh, Lindsay Stewart on the politics of joy, um, and the latest season of the Unmeet podcast. I wish I knew the episode uh, number, but I don't. Um, but you can find it on Spotify at uh, the Unmeet podcast. Anyway, I, I, I want to <laughs> say something about um, no, just the way you two both get to plug. Well, I think work. I think okay. yeah. 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 say the name of that podcast more clearly. <laughs> the Unmeet podcast. But let me just do a wonderful interview okay. about you. the politics of joy <laughs> and the way that she's framing it. Um, particularly thinking uh, about Zero Noah Hurston and, and refusals. Right. Um, I, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about for this last the last two days or so is joy. And goes back to Twitter. I've spent so much time on Twitter. I can never get that time back. But I, I would say that as I was watching videos of people celebrating, um, you know, I was also reading comments about people having problems with that celebration. And one of the worries, and I posted this on Twitter, I basically said, listen, you know, give people the space to be happy today. Give people the space to dance and to have some kind of relief. Um, and it doesn't mean uh, that they're ignorant of empire that they're being seduced by symbolism. Um, they're just happy right now and they should be able to express that happiness. Now, Lindsay talks more about refusal, but going back to, to, to Sally's point about resistance, you know, I, I, I honestly think we need to make space and give ourselves freedom, give, us, give other people freedom to make joy and relief, if only temporarily, temporary, a part of our liberation practice. Um, and not treating joy as this end goal that we get, particularly if freedom is a constant struggle, maybe, maybe, maybe a minute before we get there, right? So you, we ought not to treat, uh, treat um, uh, joy and relief as this end, this end goal, but this thing that we get along the way, right? And this goes back to care, this goes back to solidarity. Um, we need to put that into, into our freedom practice. And I don't want any kind of freedom that doesn't make space for laughter, for dancing, for joy, for relief, for release. I know things are not perfect. Um, I know uh, America is not going to transform into this ideal democracy tomorrow. I know it's not going to fix, you know, our, our ways in which we deal with our foreign policy is not going to be perfect. But for this moment, after all we've suffered for four years, this moment, let us dance together in the streets and we'll fight tomorrow. <laughs> just, I love that. I mean, it's such a good note, Dan. And I, but just adding to this picture, like two couple of things. Nietzsche, first of all, has this distinction between um, negative and positive nihilism. And the negative is this aesthetic, let me turn inward, let me self-immolate, everything is miserable. Um, you know, once you discover the kind of basic truth of nihilism, that moral progress isn't guaranteed, that nothing is meaningful, that doom is inevitable, you can go into that mode. But positive nihilism says, let's just take that as, you know, given, but let's act out. And as an old punk rocker, that was the spirit. In the 1970s, things looked really bleak. Nobody was hopeful, but they said, that's great. Let's just go out and <laughs> right. have fun. You know, let's light some fires. And even like, if you go to protest marches, even when things are really, really grim, 
you always see joy. I take pictures at marches and don't do it anymore because it's now <laughs> been revealed to be a problematic thing. But, but basically what you see is a lot of smiling. First of all, because there's strength and solidarity, but also because let's just act out. Like even if everyone gets so upset about looting, First of all, I think looting is morally justified when your neighborhood has been you know, gentrified and taken over by these big box stores that you have no ownership of and you're living in a system that's holding you down. Destruction of property is perfectly okay. I'm all right with that. But that outlet, that release, that, that kind of will to destroy is a joyous, empowering, exciting feeling. And while we haven't got enough hope to figure out what the next future is, what the solution is, what our new utopia is, without believing in utopias, you can still enjoy the beauty of those claims. Um, so I think if we don't find some joy even in, our, in these acts of rebellion, these directionless, angry acts of rebellion, um, we, we do lose some of the impetus and, and one of the few payoffs of this very hard struggle. One of, uh, one of my solidarity groups I'm a part of real quickly, um, um, not gonna say what the, what the WhatsApp group is, but they know who they are. Anyway, um, uh, we've been exchanging memes all year and they have a lot to do with the political moment. And there are times in which we share memes and my response is we gotta keep laughing and keep them crying. I mean, that's real, but that's also not only psychologically like helpful, but it is revolutionary as hell, Yeah, right? Laughing to keep from crying. Not, not um, by wrath as one kill, but by laughter, says Nietzsche. Right, <laughs> love it, love it. And one of our attendees uh, pulls up the word recognition that in these moments of solidarity and community, we recognize imagined possibilities and that makes them more real and gives power to our hope. Totally. And recognizing the other in that shared sense of what the possibilities are that we're longing for. Um, that there's a kind of, it breaks, I mean, I, I find it's being alone with the injustice and the harm and the history and all this is, is just devastating. But if you can be with others, even if you're just seeing the same horror and imagining that there might be something other than that, it, it's it's so important because dealing with it alone, what can you do? It's just, it's despair. Yeah, so send me memes. I, I, I welcome yeah. them. Um, <laughs> and what I haven't been able to get enough of, of the, 20, the last 24 hours of the cat who's like bumping its head. Send me all of those memes. I take them. I want them. Well, thank you all. It's a joy to, to think <clears throat> and to hope together and I really appreciate your time and I appreciate the time of everyone who came out um, to be part of this tonight. Me too. Thanks everybody for Thank coming. All, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah, it was really good. Thanks Thea. Thanks Trish. Thanks Mary Kay. And of course, co-panelists Jesse and Maisha. It's just such an honor to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you. Likewise. And if I can just say, maybe hope is like the Messiah. It'll come when we no longer need it. If we can learn <laughs> to rage together, to laugh together, to fight together, to recognize each other, then we can make a real difference and there will be a grounds for hope. I have nothing poetic to say because someone just <laughs> sent me a meme. Someone just sent me a meme because you asked for it. Here you go. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Take good care. Right. Okay, yes. Thank Love you. you all. <laughs> <laughs>